Welcome to Roberts Park United Methodist Church here in the downtown Indianapolis on this Ash Wednesday service. We're going to follow the traditional liturgy of Ash Wednesday. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins. God's mercy endures forever. So will you pray with me? O oh God, maker of everything and judge of all that you have made, from the dust of the earth you have formed us, and from the dust of death you would raise us up. By the redemptive power of the cross, create in us clean hearts and put within us a new spirit, that we may repent of our sins and lead lives worthy of your calling. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Join me now in hearing these words from the Hebrew Bible, Joel chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 and 12 through 17. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their like has been none before, nor will ever again after them through the years of all generations. Continuing with verse 12. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, 
Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children and even the nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the people, where is their God? Now we turn to the letters from the early church, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 20b through chapter 6, verse 10. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Working together with him then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We put no obstacles in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger. By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit and genuine love. By truthful speech with the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold, we live, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
And now we hear the gospel from St. Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 6 and 16 through 21. Beginning with verse 1, giving to the needy. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Continuing now with verse 16, fasting. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor dust or rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the word of the risen Christ for the people of Christ. Amen. Sadly, the word hypocrite is being bandied around in the media these days, particularly concerning the impeachment trial for the former President Trump and being used to describe some of the senators, having only a matter of weeks ago condemned the then president's actions. Some senators who voted to acquit Donald Trump found themselves turning a blind eye to the events of January the 6th and taking positions that were contrary to the views they expressed on that day. It's difficult to find anyone who has a kind word to say about hypocrites. Nobody likes a hypocrite. No one wants to be around one. The last thing one would want to be called is a hypocrite. Hypocrites are, by definition, deceptive, two-faced and treacherous. If discovered, hypocritical politicians are defeated at the polls. Hypocritical friends get dropped and hypocritical preachers lose their congregation's trust. It may well be that our age is particularly tough on hypocrisy. In some ways, it is the one remaining public sin. It seems today that we can tolerate embezzlement, infidelity, brawling and addiction in our public figures, but not pretense and hypocrisy. Several years ago, when a well-known television evangelist was caught flagrante delecto in a CD day rate motel, it was not so much the deed itself that brought him low, but the fact that his moral posturing, his wrenching, tear-stained appeals for understanding of forgiveness, just didn't ring true in the viewer's ears. In short, he committed the unpardonable sin. The sin against the human spirit, the sin of trying to pull an emotional fast one, the sin of hypocrisy. Father, do not forgive him, for he knows full well what he's doing. You know, positioned on the scale of evil doing somewhere between tobacco company executives and junk bunk traders, 
Hypo hypocrites are convenient villains for our cultural rage. In a therapeutic climate where people clamour to appear on Oprah or Dr. Phil to do an emotional striptease bearing in the name of candour the deepest secrets of their past in front of audiences of perfect strangers, hypocrites seem by contrast emotionally stunted. They are guarded and deceptive. They put on false and pretty faces, hiding their true selves behind the cloak of pseudo-respectability. Indeed, hypocrite was originally a theatrical term, describing actors who concealed their real countenances behind dramatic masks. The sin of hypocrisy, then, is wearing a mask. And it is in our time, it is at no transgression is more contemptible. Hypocrites conceal sadness with a smile. They say they are happy to see you when, well, they'd rather have root canal than work to be in your presence. They give money to charities that they don't truly support. They make speeches for causes that they don't really care about. And they laugh at jokes that they, well, don't really find funny. In short, hypocrites wear masks, pretending to be who they are not. Will you pray with me? All seeing God, Help us to be the masters of ourselves, that we might truly be the servants of others. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lips and speak through them. Take our hands and do your good works. Take our lives and live out your life. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for you. Religious hypocrites are, of course, the worst of the breed and the most inviting targets. In the Devil's Dictionary, Ambrose Bierce joined a long line of those who have skewered churchly hypocrisy when he defined a Christian as one who follows the teachings of Christ insofar as they are not inconsistent with a life of sin, and a member of the clergy as one who undertakes the management of our spiritual affairs as a method of bettering his temporal ones. The specific problem with religious hypocrites is that they're not the holier than thou. They are also holier than themselves. In fact, people with a sharp eye for hypocrisy would consider those who stay at home on Sundays as actually more morally superior to the hypocrites who drag themselves out of bed, show up for Sunday school. At least they aren't wearing a pious mask and living a lie. If we want to be hard on hypocrites, especially religious hypocrites, we seem to have a natural ally in Jesus. With spirited humour, Jesus mocked hypocrites as the clowns of their own moral vaudeville show. As Jesus described them, hypocrites want the trumpeter to play, hey, look me over, when they pull out their offering envelopes. They conduct prayer meetings at busy intersections during rush hour. And on fast days, they put on melancholy public faces that make them look for all the world like they have the flu. In short, they parade their deeds with a flourish before the admiring eyes of others. And that's what they want. And that's what they get. Indeed, the problem is that the adoration of the crowd is all they get. Truly I tell you, Jesus says, they have received their reward. So Jesus doesn't tolerate hypocrites, and neither should we. So much for hypocrisy. Next topic. But before we assume that Jesus fully shares our view on hypocrites, we perhaps should look again, and perhaps more closely at what he says. Oh, to be sure, the hypocrites that Jesus takes on are somehow missing the boat in their religious life, in their almsgiving and prayer and fasting. But that is not to say that there is nothing to them. Indeed, it must be acknowledged that they are people who are giving their money to the poor, who pray and who fast. When Jesus takes off after the hypocrites, He's not talking about people who thumb their noses at the synagogue or the church. He's not even talking about those who show up for worship but sit passively on their hands. To the contrary, Jesus is talking about people every faith community 
desperately needs, people who actually put the faith into practice. They are people of charity, people of prayer, people of action. They are numbered amongst those who fill out their pledge cards and volunteer to keep the nursery, who serve on committees and spearhead the social action task force and show up for the church retreats. So in order to qualify in Jesus' book as a hypocrite, one must be what every church wants and needs, an active member, indeed an energetic leader. Hypocrites may have doubts and questions about what they teach in Sunday school, but at least they teach. Hypocrites may demand brass plaques to make contributions, but at least they give. Hypocrites may use flowery, sweetie, pious language when they pray for the sick and the lonely, but they pray. Hypocrites may let it loudly be known that they volunteer one day a week for Habitat for Humanity, but at least they do buy old houses for the homeless. Well, two and a half cheers for hypocrites, not quite three cheers, but applause nonetheless. Indeed, Jesus does not attack religious hypocrites because they are so ruthlessly opposed to the gospel, truth, but rather because they have just barely missed it. Jesus says harsh things about the hypocrites, not because they are so far away from the kingdom, but because they are so very close and yet cannot see the true destination. The praying, the fasting, the almsgiving, the hypocrites of Jesus' day were not headed in the wrong direction. They were on the right path, but they didn't take their faith, well, far enough. They didn't go only part of the way. They weren't willing to settle for the minimum wage for human adulation when so very near. Just around the bend, in fact, lies the real treasure we all seek, the affirmation and intimacy of God. Hypocrites are like some children who exhibit behavioral problems in school. Having lost the hope of being loved and cared for at home, they become show-offs in the classroom, creating spectacles of themselves for the amusement of others. Having despaired of the parental blessing, they settle for the momentary reward of the schoolroom spotlight. It's not the kind of attention they really need, but it is the attention that they're sure to get. Just so, hypocrites have lost sight of the blessing of the divine parent that they have at home, lost sight of the God who sees in secret, who cherishes in the divine heart, who graciously rewards beyond measure. Therefore, they are condemned to parade around in front of the only audience they have left to impress, other people. Jesus' harsh reprimand of hypocrisy, then, is intended to reclaim, not to destroy. Indeed, Jesus' scolding words are but whitecaps on the sea of providence. Underneath, the reproach is the promise of God that desires to draw near in mercy and redemption. You know, there's a hold, uh, an old Hasidic tale about three pious Jews who decided to travel to a distant city to spend the high holy days with a famous rabbi. They set out on their journey without food or money, intending to walk the entire way. And yet several days into the journey, weak from hunger and still a long way from their destination, they knew that they had made a mistake and that they must do something. So they came up with a plan. They decided that one of them would disguise himself as a rabbi. That way, when they came to the next village, the people would offer them food, honoured to have a rabbi visit their town. None of the three, being pious, wished to be deceitful. So they drew straws, and the unlucky one who drew the short straw had to don the clothing of a rabbi. Another dressed as his assistant. When they drew near to the next village, they were greeted with an excited cry of joy. A Rebbe is coming! A Rebbe is coming! Escorted with great ceremony to the local inn, the hungry threesome were treated to a sumptuous meal. And when the meal was over, the innkeeper approached the rabbi and spoke with great sorrow. Rebbe, 
you must pray for my son, he said. He is dying, and the doctors have given up hope, but the Holy One, blessed be his name, may respond to your prayers. The counterfeit rabbi looked desperately to his friends for help. They motioned for him to go with the innkeeper to the son's bedside. They had begun this hypocritical ruse, and now there was no choice but to keep the game going. The mock rabbi accompanied the distraught father to his son's sick bed. <laughs> that night, the three travelers slept fitfully, and they were eager to leave the town before their deception was discovered. And so, in the morning, the innkeeper, still hoping for a miracle and grateful for the prayer of this visiting rabbi, sent the party off with a loan of a carriage and a team of horses. They left the village and traveled to the great city where they spent magnificent holy days under the spell of the famous rabbi. His teaching of the Torah carried their spirits to the very vault of heaven. But too soon, the holy days were at an end, and the three companions had to go back home, returning through the same village that they borrowed the carriage and horses from. Terrified, the mock rabbi resumed his disguise. His heart was in his throat as they approached the village, especially when he saw the innkeeper running towards him, waving his arms furiously. But to the pretender's delight and surprise, the innkeeper embraced him with joy, exclaiming, Oh, thank you, Rabbi, thank you. Only an hour after you left my village, my son arose from his bed well and strong. The doctors are amazed, but my son lives, and I am grateful for your faithful prayer. <laughs> the two companions looked with astonishment at the phony rabbi companion. What had happened? Had his prayer healed the boy? Well, was he truly a rabbi? Without telling them, did they not know that he had some special power? When they were alone, they turned on him with their questions. What had he done at the boy's deathbed? He replied that he had stood at the boy's side in silence and then began to lift his thoughts to heaven. Master of the universe, please, this father and son should not be punished just because they think I'm a rabbi. What am I? I am nothing, a pretender. If this child dies, his father will think a rabbi can do nothing. So, master of the universe, not because of me, but because of this father and his faith, can it hurt that his son should be healed? The Hasidim tell this story because of its profound insight into all of us. We are all pretenders, hypocrites. None of us is so worthy as to merit God's favor. Our religion is a mask we hide behind. But God is gracious and redemptive in spite of our pretense. Perhaps then Jesus reprimands the hypocrites because while well, only a sharply pointed rebuke can poke a hole in the hypocrite's facade, allowing just enough light of the gospel to stream through with the news that every human being longs to hear, that when the applause of our admiring cry dies out and the theatre stands dark and empty, and the pretender in all of us removes the mask and stands there, like the false rabbi in the old tale, all alone. There is still God, the God who knows our conduct and is well aware that we have primped around the classroom showing off for others, the God who nevertheless sees in secret, the God who looks behind the mask to find the child yearning to come home the God who beckons us to come just as we are.
Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, the early Christians observed with great devotion the days of our Lord's passion and resurrection. And it became the custom of the church that before the Easter celebration, there should be a 40-day season of spiritual preparation. During this season, converts to the faith were prepared for holy baptism. It was also a time when persons who had committed serious sins and had separated themselves from the community of the faith were reconciled by penitence and forgiveness and restored to participation in the life of the church. In this way, the whole congregation was reminded of the mercy and forgiveness proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ and the need we all have to renew our faith. I invite you, therefore, in the name of the Church, to observe a holy Lent by self-examination and repentance, by prayer, fasting, and self-denial, and by reading and meditating on God's holy word, to make a right beginning of repentance as a mark of our mortal nature. We come before our Creator and Redeemer. Almighty God, you've created us out of the dust of the earth. Grant that these ashes may be to us a sign of our mortality and penitence, so that we may remember that only by your gracious gift are we given everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. We will continue now with the prayer of confession from Psalm 51. You'll find the words on your screen, so please respond with the bold print. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done that which is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was born into iniquity, and I have been sinful since my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear with joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new spirit right inside me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from death, O God, God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice were I to give a burnt offering. You would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, 
a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Amen. May the almighty and merciful God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but that we turn from wickedness and live, accept your repentance, forgive your sins, and restore you by the Holy Spirit to newness of life. Amen. Let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Hallelujah, Lord, it's me. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. It's may the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and remain with you always. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.